Simon Dool, The Ashes. Day one overnight. 393 for five Australia. 339, three I think it was for five, wasn't it, Australia? Dooley, welcome back. Cheers, Marty. Nice to be here. How much of The Ashes did you watch day one? I uh, watched a lot of day one today. Um, yep. Uh, tough old day for England again, having won the toss, selected to bowl, didn't bowl well. No balls, sort of um, problems again. I think they bowled 20 something, 24 up in Birmingham. They bowled another 10 or 11 today. And um, just discipline, not good enough, really. You'd sort of like to think they would have improved from test match number one, but it wasn't really there. And you just you always felt that Lubbershane and Smith were going to have uh, stages through the series where they were going to get runs. Well, it looks like Smith's on his way, and, and Lubbershane with just a, what, 47 today looked pretty good. So Aussie, I would have thought, been put into bat well and truly in control on day one. Obviously here in New Zealand it starts at 10.30 at night and so people, you know, there's only a handful of people are going to sit there up all night and watch it. So just explain to us the difference in the way that Australia approached the batting day one. In Birmingham, England hell for leather, you know, they're doing reverse ramps, they're doing all these shots, they get 393 and then they put uh, Australia back in with a few overs to go. Australia 339 for five, that's a lot of runs but how did they approach it? Mm. Well, Warner was um, relatively aggressive, but they just got a lot of four balls. I'll be honest with you, there was a lot of bad bowling. Kawaja batted a long time for his 17, um, and Travis Head was very aggressive. But just the start to his innings and the start to Steve Smith in particular, where he just got gifted half volleys and gifted runs at the start of his innings. Travis Head, short and wide, short and wide, and was sort of 20 off 20 within no time. Smith was a bit the same at the start of his innings. So Warner was a little more aggressive than he probably has been, um, but he had plenty of deliveries. So, you know, I, I just think England were well and truly under the, you know, under under par as far as their performances were concerned. Broad's gone at fours. Robinson's gone at over fours. Tongue's gone at nearly fives. Stokes only bowled three overs. So, um, yeah, Aussie approached it with... Um, I guess just medium aggression, get the bad balls out, uh, get the good balls out, sorry, and really did punish anything bad. But 339 on day one, and only 83 overs as well, mate, not even 90 overs, represents some really good value. I think they will bowl a lot better on it, although I was very, very surprised that they left Scott Boland out and, and have played Mitchell Stark. That could be could be a mistake. Simon Dool is with us talking Nash's day one. I'm going to mention the Just Stop Oil protest only because, I, you know, I just want to punch this person in the face. But, you know, I mean, OK, but we'll talk about that in a second. 170 runs off boundaries, mate. You had uh, 41 fours and one six. So that says, I mean, that's an awful lot, isn't it? That's, that, I mean, geez, God damn. I mean, I'm just uh, adding that up now. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it is. It is. And that, that's what I say. I mean, a lot of four balls. Lords is one of those places, though, Marty, when you get the ball rolling down the hill, it just, it just, it is hard to catch up with um, from a fielding point of view. So on a greenish surface, when it's sliding onto the back quite nicely, um, you will get quite a few boundaries down the bottom side of the ground. Um, for those that are not sort of familiar with Lords, if you think about a cricket ground or think about any, any surface, think about a rugby rugby field the length of a rugby field not the width and you imagine if it sloped 12 foot from one end of the rugby field to the other end so basically you are playing uphill one half and completely downhill the other half that is exactly what lords is it's around about 100 just over 100 and something meters from top to bottom and it slopes 12 feet so can so you see when, when you're standing when on that end down the hill can you see can you actually see you know fully up the other end when you're standing right at the bottom you can, but um, there, you know, if, if somebody was to lie down and you're at the top and you lie, you you no chance of seeing them. Right. There's those sorts of things that can happen. It's it's crazy. It really is. The first time you step out on the ground, you you actually, you know, it is a really weird, weird feeling. Okay. Um, and twelve foot slope over 120 meters is is a heck quite of a lot. gradient. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the selections then because you did have concerns last time for England, but you say that Mitchell Stark... Look, I mean, let's look at England to start with. Okay, so they just came in with a complete mm. pace attack, no spinner. That's probably because they don't have one. But is that was that was that a good selection move? I still would have played around Ahmed. I, I just think that at some stage through this test match... So England went into the start of the test series. Remember back before the first test, Ben Stokes wanted flat pitches, good batting wickets, and he wanted, you know, wanted to be able to plunder runs. 
and then they picked a spinner who couldn't bowl more than 10 overs because of his finger blew out. And so from test number one and prior to the Ashes and all the, all the talk, they've changed their tack completely to test number two, asked for a green seaming pitch and played four seamers and tried to bowl first. So they've completely changed tack all of a sudden after one test match loss where they picked completely the wrong side in the first test. So I just, there's some real questions that have got to be asked now about this selection policy first and foremost and, and, and the tactics. And are they just sort of flitting and, and farting between games and not really sure what they're doing? Have they run and are things starting to unravel quietly behind the scenes? Because you just don't change your tactics after one test match completely and go somewhere else because you haven't got the right side or the right attack. I think Rayhan Ahmed should have still played. Uh, I think he's a very talented cricketer. Got five in uh, Pakistan on debut. He's a very aggressive batter, so he fits the mould nicely. And he will he could bowl as many overs as Joe Root and some. So I, I don't see um, why they didn't go with him. Uh, but having said that, Josh Tung, I still would have played Tung. I would have left Broad out probably in, in this test match. Um, or, or Anderson, dare I say it. They both look a little bit... Anderson in particular looks a little bit under undercooked and under par, and and uh, he was very grumpy after the first test match as well, and said, "If the test pitches are going to be like this for the rest of the summer, I will retire." Uh, well, uh, maybe a uh, bears ball starting to fray a little around the edges because also they won the toss. You'd expect them to go after it, but this time they're playing a little conservative. Mitchell Stark is bowling. He's uh, him, Cummins, Nathan Lyon, and Hazelwood are still to bat. Yes, yeah. So, look, I, I just think. I mean, I, I think the sort of surface is when you look at what um, Josh Tung did today, Scott Boland is a far better exponent of what what Tung was able to do okay. today. And I think they might miss him. I think that, um, to me, Mitchell Stark is a little bit more along the wicket. He's the sort of guy who would play on a really dry, um, rough surface because it will reverse swing later on in the piece. On this sort of pitch, on a green one, I don't know that I would have played him ahead of uh, Scotty Boland. You're not going to leave Cummins out and you're not going to leave Hazelwood out. So that was their only option. I can understand they're trying to get through, um, you know, five test matches and, and probably will use Stark and Boland in and out a little bit throughout the series. Um, but, yeah, this is one where I would have played Scotty Boland. But, look, they're, they're in the box seat and they've still got batting to come. If they can scrape anything above 400, 450, uh, is a very, very imposing first innings total, I think. Simon Dool with us. The Just Stop Oil protesters. Okay, so they've done snooker, they've done Premier League, they've done rugby. We expect them to be all over Wimbledon. Here they go, they run onto the pitch here. And look, the danger is uh, when you take the law into your own hands, like Stokes did, Warner did, Bairstow did, trying to wrestle these idiots off the field. You know, we saw it with Terry Alderman. I mean, you will actually remember this story when he, he tried to tackle a streaker, I think, did his shoulder, and that was pretty much stuffed his whole career, didn't it, back in the ashes, back in the mm. 80s, I think it was. Oh, look, I, you know, I'm a protester from hell and from way back and all of that kind of stuff, but this stuff makes me so angry now. I think that what sport has done, mate, is it's opened the door to these morons by, you know, every time we put a rainbow flag on something, and I'm not picking on that particularly, but I'm just saying every time we allow protests to come into sport, people like this then get the clue and the idea that you've got a static audience, a massive audience, a live audience, cameras and everything else. There's no better place to do it. Go and do it at the UFC and see how well you actually get through that crowd, if that's the case. Go and do it at Putin's Economic Forum or something like that. I just, I'm starting to get really to the stage now where... I don't know. I mean, these guys, something's got to be done to stop this. Yeah, what can you do, though, I guess? I mean, you know, the tickets weren't cheap, so they've obviously shouted a bit of money to uh, to pay for the tickets first and foremost to get in there, and then they've done it within two balls. So they're not interested in the cricket for, at, at all. They're only interested in the eyeballs and the protesting. Um, I think the reason that the guys took it into their own hands a little bit is because if they had got that onto the pitch itself, it would have delayed the test quite considerably. So all they were trying to do was keep them away from the actual pitch area. The outfield, whatever it was, was just able to be um, sort of dusted off and, and carry on the game. So I think that's the one reason why you saw Stokes and Warner and Bairstow in particular just try and keep them off the actual playing surface. I oh, Look, I, I don't, you know, I mean, I'm not a protester. I, it's not really my go. I understand that people have passion and, and causes and things that they believe in and... Um, is that the right way to go about it? Not in my opinion, but geez, I'm not that way inclined. So I, I, I honestly don't know. I'm, 
sort of I don't like seeing it. Um, I don't like the fact that it that sort of ruins um, you know the moment or ruins the sporting events. But we're going to see more and more of it. You're right. They'll be at Wimbledon, guaranteed. They'll be trying to do something there because it's a captive audience. It's the eyeballs. It's it's this is the most watched Test series in the world, and and they know that their you know their message might just just get across. Um, so. That's kind of yeah. That's kind of where I'm at on it, mate. I, I as I say, I don't. I'm not a protester. It wouldn't be my cup of tea. I wouldn't do it. But I do understand that people have things to protest about. All right, your Chiefs lost, mate, and both of us are sitting here every day looking at the transfer market, going, "Come on, little oh. liver, come on, lads, buy some bloody players, mate." Buy some players. Buy some players. I mean, Chief, how? Oh, look, I didn't get to see the game, Marty, and I, I just I see that um, Ben O'Keefe got a, an absolute yeah, I know, barge by, yes. from social media. I oh, look. It, it's is it just the normal normal sort of stuff the crusaders were just too good on the day and and they just know how to win and 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 you know is that the case was it that bad yeah. I, I don't really yeah no look, the, look, of, the, I, don't look I don't indulge in the in the social media commentary and mate because i just think you know these people are idiots morons and and serial masturbators but in terms of the crusaders you're exactly right mate i mean that's all it is i mean they're just too bloody good when it come down to it the last 15 minutes they didn't make a mistake at the breakdown they pressured yeah, and, and and they they actually force what they've always done is they've forced the opposition, much like the All Blacks used to do. You think about what the All Blacks used to do. They would force the opposition to make a mistake. Yeah, yeah. And it didn't matter how they won or when they won, but as long as it was before the, the, the final whistle yeah, went. You know, they totally. could take 80 minutes. They could take 81 minutes. The Irish game. All these sorts of things. And it's just kind of what the Crusaders have done for a long, long period of time. They're a very disciplined outfit. They make the other side, you know, force the error. And, and they will pounce on it at some stage. It might not be then and there, but it might be, and it might be down the track. But they, they make you pay for it at some stage. And geez, it just sounded like a very similar scenario to, to ones I've seen for many, many years, sadly.